In this video, we'll discuss what's called the three box model memory, also known as the three stages of memory. Well, there's different models for memory. In this one, storage comes from different locations. We have our sensory memory, we have short-term memory, and we have long-term memory. So incoming sensory input goes into the sensory memory. If we don't attend to it, that information is not transferred and it's lost. If we attend to it, we get it in short-term memory. Short-term memory, again, we have to rehearse that information, we have to attend to it and encode it in some way. If we don't get it into long-term memory, that information is gonna be lost. When we get information into long-term memory, it's theoretically stored there indefinitely. So we're gonna go through each one of these boxes. So again, the first one is a sensory memory. And this is going to be everything that comes from our sensory systems, everything that hits our ears, our eyes, our nose, our mouth, any sensory stimuli that we could need to remember. We can't attend to it all, however. And so it's only held in that sensory memory for a very brief period of time, about a half a second for visual information and two seconds for auditory sensations. And that prevents double exposures. So again, very brief, and we need to attend to that information or we lose it. So think about this situation for an auditory example. So maybe you're watching TV, you're reading a book, and someone asks you a question. And you respond and you say, excuse me, only to realize before they answer the question, or maybe even before you get out those words, that you actually did hear what they had to say. That's because the sensory registry held that information in its holding bin just long enough for you to turn your attention away from what you were doing and to the new activity. So you were reading a book, you heard some sort of auditory stimulation, Within two seconds, you turned to attend to that information, and so you're able to register that information. So again, think of this as very fleeting, very brief. Sometimes if you think about those little water buckets that come around, they take water and they go down and they dump it into the river, you can think of it like that. It's very brief. If you don't take that water and put it somewhere else, in this case, short-term memory, it's gonna be dumped into that river and, and lost forever. Short-term memory, you can think of as like a scratch pad. It's meant to be temporary. It's there to, well, you keep that scratch piece of paper with you, but in time you'll throw it away. You're not gonna keep that scratch piece of paper forever. So we keep things in our short-term memory for about 30 seconds to up to a few minutes. While we're actively using it, that information is there. And we need to encode that information or we're gonna lose that information. So sometimes short-term memory is also referred to as working memories, and in other cases, working memory is distinguished as a completely different type of memory. So one way to get that information from short-term memory into long-term memory is to rehearse it. And rehearsal is kind of like it sounds, right? If you think about a person practicing for a play or a choir performance or a they're in a band, they're gonna rehearse that material over and over again, right? They're gonna practice it over and over again. So again, it's a way to get information from short-term memory into long-term memory. But the question is, so you're rehearsing that information, you're repeating it over and over again. And while we're doing that, it stays in short-term memory, but the goal is eventually to get that into long-term memory so we don't have to actively keep practice, practicing that over and over again. So the question is, how much can we retain in our um, short-term memory? How, much, how, many, how many pieces of information can we actively use and rehearse over and over again? And it is pretty limited still probably even more so than our sensory memory. But if we chunk the information into meaningful units, we can retain a bit more. Now, George Miller in the 1950s suggested we could hold about seven chunks of information, plus or minus two, so that goes from five to nine chunks of information in our short-term memory. There are places that report that we can, some people can hold up to 20 pieces of information in short-term memory, and newer research suggests that it might be only four plus or minus two. So, but we're gonna try to, for this class, we're gonna remember that magical number of seven chunks of information. And maybe it's decreased due to the use of cell phones and the poor, poor attention that's created by them. So now I'm gonna present you with a list of letters and I want you to memorize them in the exact order presented. I'm not gonna read them aloud, I just want you to look at them on the screen Take about 30 seconds and try to remember them. All right. 
Now, I don't want you really to keep rehearsing them over and over again. Do you think about something else? Do you have a favorite animal? I love dolphins. All right, now take out a piece of paper and write down what you can remember. Now turn your paper over and I'm gonna present the letters in a little different way. And let's see if this helps you remember them more. Again, I'm not gonna read them aloud. They're just gonna be presented on the screen. Take again about 30 seconds and try to remember these. So this shows the value of chunking. When I presented those 16 individual letters, it was probably a lot harder to try to remember them. You may not have remembered them unless you kept repeating them over and over in your, your head, but we didn't want you to do that. Now, when I've broken them into instead of 16 letters, we now have one, two, three, four, five chunks of information and meaningful units, or hopefully, right? MTV um, and it's probably not as popular as it once was, but we've all heard of CBS, the FBI, CIA, IBM, and then X is just a letter. So chunking allows us to remember the beginning of a sentence or a long string of numbers by grouping them into meaningful units. We chunk in everyday life, phone numbers, right? We chunk them into the um, area code, then the prefix and the suffix. People's addresses, uh, whether you, maybe your address is 20111, you might remember it as 20111. And so again, you're chunking things into meaningful units so that you can remember more of that information. So long-term memory is the long-term storage of memory. It's the information that we retrieve later on that helps us learn about ourselves, about our environment. It tells us about our place and position in the world. And theoretically, it has no real limits. Now, since we can remember so much information, it must be organized in some way that helps us retrieve it. And one of the ways we've already talked about are semantic categories. We encode things semantically, and thus we have semantic categories, like that last activity where we saw we had animals, occupations, um, names, and vegetables. There are also other ways to organize that information, sound and form, that kind of tip of the tongue. So think about when you, you, you know the word, it's just right there, and you know it starts with a B, but all you can think of is, is box and brain and billboard but the word those, those aren't the words right the word is maybe it's a bobcat so it's something it's on the tip of our tongue it has the same sound same form you just can't think of what it is but all those other words have the same sound or similar sounds and form familiarity so familiarity is another way that we might organize things how familiar you are with something that association with personal experiences with other information Relevance, again, how relevant is the information to you? And then again, the one way, familiarity and relevance are also kind of related to this, but associating that information with other information that you previously knew. So when you learn something new, try to associate that information with previously existing memories. And then that gives you more retrieval cues, it helps you understand it better. So these are all different ways in which long-term memory can be organized. Now in the next video, we'll talk about the different types of long-term memory.